ask anyone around the world what image they immediately associate with modern-day China, and if they're old enough, many will point to this one. 1989, standoff on Tiananmen Square, one man demanding democracy against one tank and one party, the Chinese Communist Party. Well, we know what happened here. A massacre that snuffed out any hope of revolution. But inside China, these images, this history, they've been erased, willed out of existence by the Communist Party. This week, China's Communist Party is marking its 100th anniversary with nationwide celebrations, festivities, and fanfare, all approved for public consumption by Beijing. Now, the party's origins go back to 1921, a secret meeting of 53 people in a home in Shanghai. In 1949, following a civil war, party leader Mao Zedong seized power in China. He oversaw decades of war, famine, and repression, and exerted a monopoly over both state and society. In the late 1970s, China began opening up for business, and decades of unprecedented economic growth followed. Today, China is the world's second biggest economy, an achievement that President Xi Jinping is touting, among many others. But in China, what is fact and what is fiction? Today, tourist boats ply this lake, but 100 years ago, it was a small group of Marxists who sought out this idyllic spot. They had convened in Shanghai, but the fear of spies saw them move their meeting to a boat on Nanhu Lake, 100 kilometers south of the city. Here is where they founded the Communist Party. Today, Nanhu receives visitors from all over China. It is the Communist Party that stands for and has brought us the good life we have today. The government has built an impressive museum on the shore. Visitors are told the story of a party that has tirelessly fought for the renaissance of the Chinese nation. But during the Cultural Revolution, millions were humiliated and killed. Or there was Mao's great famine with tens of millions of victims by an erroneous collectivization policy. Those pictures are absent from the exhibition. Of course, in the development of a party like ours, there are achievements and there are problems. But overall, our party has maintained the right course and has made great efforts. So in our exhibition, we focus on this big trend, on what really matters. Not everyone sees the trend in the same way. Wu Qiang is one of the few critics who still dare to speak out. He compares the party's confidence to Germany and Japan before World War II. They paint the picture of an ascending global power whose rise is inevitable. It is the kind of fanatic nationalism that the world saw 100 years ago. The Communist Party is completely incapable of introspection and to reflect on itself. All over the country, historic party locations are turning into pilgrimage sites. Here in Shanghai, the party founders convened before fleeing to the lake. Party cells from all over China have been organizing visits to the site. The exhibition has received a complete makeover with a prominent role for President Xi Jinping. Here too, party history is a carefully engineered narrative. Xu Jia is historian at the Party History Institute, which is supervised by the Central Committee. There are materials we cannot publish. This has to do with our position, our research, our communication have to serve the party, the people, the country. That is our standpoint. Beijing is pulling out all the stops to celebrate the centennial of the Chinese Communist Party. But it's a party that remains under extremely tight control. Well, my second guest tonight grew up during China's Cultural Revolution. Today, she lives in the U.S. and runs China Change, a website covering the stories that don't make it past the censors, shining a light on human rights abuses in China. Yashui Tao joins me now. It's good to have you on the program. China's Communist Party is turning 100 years old 
It has ruled the country for over 70 years. It outlived the Soviet Union. What is the secret to its success? Tight control. Um, so the first 30 years, I, I heard the, uh, the program pre, uh, before me, uh, it was uh, disastrous, right? Mm -hmm. So the, uh, the opening up and the reform is really a uh, uh, half-hearted. There are things they wanted to uh, open up and the reform to take advantage of the rest of the world, the market and technology, um, and the world welcomed China. But uh, there are parts that China does not, the, the Communist Party has never uh, meant to, to reform or opening up. To answer your question, the secret really is very simple. Uh, anyone who traveled in China in late 70s or, or throughout the 80s, uh, you, you saw China, what China was like. Everybody was uh, suppressed down, uh, you know, have a fixed place to work, fixed place to live, uh, have a little uh, freedom to just travel or, or money to do so. But uh, after the, uh, uh, the reform and the opening up, it's like, a, I like to give a, a metaphor, like a curfew. That's the cur previously the curfew was set at 3 p.m. Uh, 3 p.m. during the day. And now the curfew is lifted up to midnight. Mm -hmm. So people uh, did enjoy uh, freedom to some extent, but uh, um, they, uh, or another metaphor, like a cage. The cage was very, very small. Everybody was stuffed there, mm -hmm. uh, can't move. Now the cage is rather, uh, it's uh, somewhat big. And people, there are many people, Chinese, inside China, who are so brainwashed, they forgot that there, uh, there's a cage. Well, now you, so you, the success. Yeah, sure. Let me just ask you. Yeah, let me just ask you. Is, yeah. let, let me just ask you though. The, the Chinese people they have experienced unprecedented economic growth in the last decades. Many people now are wealthy. You've got a big middle class, and it's growing. Have they allowed themselves? to be um, almost to be bought by the Communist Party. We give up our right to rule ourselves in exchange for material goods that the rest of the world has. Well, um, the, uh, the middle class Chinese are, have been for a good 20 years, increasingly aware of their rights and uh, their uh, the am freedom side of the society, uh, even including those who live in the system, by which I mean they work for the state. Um, I think uh, what you just said is a, is a, a, a half-truth narrative that we sort of uh, describe uh, the middle class in China. But the thing is, uh, the Chinese uh, in general, especially the middle class, they understand that if they ask more, there will be punishment. So they have learned not to ask more. Are they satisfied? I really don't think so. Yashui Tao, the founder and editor of China Change, we appreciate your time and your insights tonight. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but um, we appreciate you giving us um, an insider's view of what is happening in China. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.